In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of one-way analysis of variance. Returning to the situation from the first video. From the first video, we're, we're examining the activation times for yeast for four different recipes. For the four different recipes, we started with a hypothesis that the mean activation time for the four recipes is the same. All the skeptics' hypothesis is that there's no difference in the mean activation times versus the mean activation time for at least one of the recipes is different than the others. Our test statistic, we said, was an F ratio, the variation between groups over the variation within groups. If the groups are the same, then, then the top and the bottom, the numerator and the denominator, should be about the same, so the F ratio should be about 1. If the groups are different, the variation between groups gets very large, but the variation within groups doesn't change. So the more different the groups are, the greater the, num the numerator is, the greater the overall F ratio is. The uh, decision rule is reject H0 if p-value is less than whatever alpha is given. What we did then is we conducted that hypothesis test via StatCrunch, received these data. The p-value is less than 0 0.0001, which means we found an F ratio of 44, which is very rare if the means of all the groups, the mean activation times of the four recipes, is truly the same. Since that p-value is less than 0.0001, is less than 0.05, the level of significance, we reject H0. Thus, we conclude that the mean activation times for at least one of the recipes is different than the others. Now, notice that this hypothesis test does not determine, it doesn't say, well, you know, um, recipe C has, a, has the longest activation time. It just says at least one of the activation times is different than the others. To determine which ones differ, what we've got to do is we've got to conduct multiple comparisons. So I'm going to go back to StatCrunch for that. Under StatCrunch, and let me, uh, let me just bring this up so uh, we can see it, we had the mean activation times. And the mean activation times, uh, there we go. Um, the me these, these are the data we uh, basically There we go. I'm sorry about that. Um, we conducted the hypothesis test. Now, if you go back to options and edit, notice that under the uh, options, one of the options you compared the we, we compared the activation times. The, the activation times were in a single column, so our responses, our data were in activation times. The factors were in recipes. If you keep going down in this options page, you've got one of the options is compute two key HSD. Basically, these are confidence intervals at 95% confidence level. So I'm going to check check if I want to conduct the, the multiple comparisons. I'm going to check the compute two key HSD. Then I'm just going to compute the value again. Notice that this at the top doesn't change. So what I have here is just what I had before. But what I've done is now I also have these confidence intervals. Okay? And I'm going to talk about those. So I'm going to go back to go back to the uh, PowerPoint file. And here is what you'd get from StatCrunch. So this is if you chose if you do find a difference, um, then you would conduct the confidence intervals, construct the confidence intervals rather, and this is what you get. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what these things mean. Okay, so the first one, let's look at the first one. The first one says A subtracted from B. And I go back, so you see A subtracted from B. So I'm just going to look at that line. The difference, this is the difference between the sample means of 290, lower and upper, give me the upper and lower ends for the confidence interval. Now what is the confidence interval of? It's a confidence interval of the mean for recipe A subtracted from the mean for recipe B. So it's basically the confidence interval for the difference in means, just like we did for, for two samples. So what I have is I have a 95% confidence interval for the difference in mean B, the mean activation times for recipe B, minus the mean activation times for recipe A. We're 95% confident that that, conf that that difference in, this, in the means is between negative 434.84, 
and negative 145.15. The significance, really, what you want to pay attention to here is not necessarily what these values are, but just that the bottom limit is negative, the top limit is negative, so I can say with a, a relatively high degree of confidence that the mean activation time for recipe B is minus the mean activation time for recipe A. Basically, I'm pretty sure it's in the negative range. It's between negative 434 and negative 145, so I'm pretty sure it's less than zero. Now, just doing a little bit of algebra, that says that we're 95% confident that the mean activation time for recipe B is less than the mean activation time for recipe A. Now, in your response on your problem, you'd say, well, since negative 434.84 is less than the mean of B minus the mean of A, is less than negative 145.15, we can conclude, essentially with 95% confidence, that the mean activation time for recipe B is less than the mean activation time for recipe A. Now, let's look at another, another situation. If we go down the list, notice we had the A subtracted from C. Just like we did before, that's the confidence interval for the mean of C minus the mean of A. Notice it's A subtracted from C, so mean of C minus mean of A. We're 95% confident that that difference in those means, those population means, is between positive 24.9 and positive 314.6. So notice that the bottom limit is positive, the top limit is positive, so I'm 95% confident, I'm really pretty sure that the difference in activation times for recipe C minus recipe A is positive. I'm pretty sure it's between about 25 and about 315. Again, doing a little bit of algebra, I'm pretty confident that then that the mean activation time for recipe C is greater than the mean activation time for recipe A. So here are two of the options. Notice that if the basically if the two limits, the upper and lower limits, are both negative, I can reach a decision about which one's bigger. If the upper and lower limits are both positive, I can also reach a decision. Basically, again, what you what you'd say is since 24.9 is less than the mean of C minus the mean of A, it's less than 314.6. We can conclude with 95% confidence that the mean activation time for recipe C is greater than the mean activation time for recipe A. Again, the values themselves aren't what's significant. In this case, what's significant is that both of the limits for the confidence interval are positive. Lastly, let's look at the, at the, at the, the last sort of option, which is from the middle, from if you look here, it's um, this one right here, uh, B subtracted from D. So let me look at that. Uh, there it is. Okay, so B subtracted from D. It's a confident, 95% confidence interval for the mean of, of B subtracted from the mean of D, or, or mean D minus mean of B. We're 95% confident that that difference in those means is between negative 157.5 and positive 132.35. So here's what's significant about that. Notice that this says that this difference in sample means could be in this negative range. It's also possible that this difference in sample means could be in the positive range. So in other words, um, if, the, if it's in the negative range, that would say that the mean of D is less than the mean of B. If it turns out to be in the positive range, that means that it's possible that the mean of D is greater than the mean of B. Notice, uh, I didn't note this in the, I just realized this in the, when I'm looking at the interval. Notice what's also between a negative and a positive is zero. It's possible that the mean of D minus the mean of B is equal to zero. In other words, it's possible that the mean of D and the mean of B are equal. So in general, mean of D could be less than the mean of B, could be greater than the mean of B, it could be equal to the mean of B. The bottom line is when you find an interval that's both negative and positive, we cannot determine which of the activation times is bigger. So your conclusion, since negative 157.35 is less than mean of D minus mean of B, is less than 132.35, notice we have a negative on one end, a positive on the other, that says we cannot determine which of the two activation times for recipe D or recipe B is greater. So I'm going to sum up in, in a couple slides the conclusion and then give you a sample of what I might ask on a test or a quiz or, or any sort of assessment. 
basically from the two key intervals I reach certain conclusions and basically using the using the reasoning I just went through with the three previous examples from the first one we conclude that the mean of B is less than the mean of A the mean of C is greater than the mean of A and the mean of D is less than the mean of A going down to the next comparison we know that the mean of C is greater than the mean of B from this, uh, this fourth line, or fifth line, excuse me, we can't reach a conclusion because we have a negative limit on the bottom, a positive limit on the top. And lastly, again, notice we have all negatives in this one. We're going to conclude that the mean of D is less than the mean of C. Now that's still pretty symbolic, and I'm a, I'm a pretty visual thinker. So what I've done is I've written this like, basically I like to draw pictures for this. Here are the conclusions. Okay, and so what do I say? I, I just kind of try to graph these. I look at this, I say mean of B is less than mean of A. So I put mean A here somewhere, it doesn't really matter where, and B is less than A. D is also less than A, so I put D somewhere less than A. C is greater than A, so I put C greater than A, a little bit higher on the number line. Go down to the next set of conclusions, and we know that C is greater than B. Well, we really knew that from the first one. This, 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 this conclusion really doesn't tell us more than what we knew from up here. We also know that D is less than B. Again, we know that, so put that, putting that together, we know that C is greater than A and A is greater than D. So by transitivity, we know that C is greater than D. Lastly, this one is important. No conclusion can be reached about C and D. Excuse me, it's B and D. It should be B and D. I'm going to correct that right now. B. There we go. All right. And uh, that says we really can't tell which one's greater. So I put those two together. That's why I did that. So here's some sample interpretations I might ask. One question I might ask is, which recipe has the greatest, the longest activation time? So from our conclusions and from my little visual I've, con I've constructed, I'd conclude that recipe C has the longest activation time. So in other words, recipe C, for recipe C, it takes the longest time to activate the yeast. Another question I might ask is which recipe gives you the shortest activation time on average? Excuse me, I should make note of that. These are all on average mean activation times. So from my visual, from my conclusions in visual, I conclude, I can't say which one, but I can say either recipe B or recipe D has the shortest mean activation time. Lastly, you know, the problem itself, if you look in the text, gives you box plots we can kind of see, you know, we're going to confirm our conclusions. What we conclude is that recipe B or D gives us the shortest, active, shortest activation time. Recipe A is in the middle, so to speak. And recipe C gave us the longest activation time. Now you might say, well, why can't I just look at the box plot and make those conclusions? What statistics does is it looks at these differences and says, okay, a, the difference between A and B is pretty significant. I'm, it's, it's bigger than what I would expect from chance. I mean, so I statistically, we're going to say that this is a, a good size difference. We're going to include they're different. You really can't tell that just in the picture. They may look different, but it might be that they're close enough that you, that, you know, that just like flipping a coin, if you flip a coin, you know, 50 times, sometimes you get 48 heads, sometimes you get 52 heads. That's not a great difference. Here, what statistics does to determine whether the difference between these activation times is really significant. All right, so these, these, this box plot really does confirm the results that we found. One last comment for you bakers out there, and I do, I do do a little baking myself. I, uh, I actually like to make pizza. I learned to do it in graduate school. I don't know why I would put milk and milk into my pizza dough recipe. I just use plain water, but we're going to do what the statistics book tells us here. So maybe I should try milk in my pizza. That's not part something I'd write in my conclusion, but I'm curious. Anyways, if you have questions, let me know. Thanks so much.